Okay. So again, thanks everyone for being here this morning. We have Jessica Brennan from, who's a managing solicitor of the Cavan Law Center with Legal Aid Board here this morning with us. And we also have one of her colleagues, Claire. Claire, I might butcher your last name, Castanel. Is that Perfect. the Castanel, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, and Claire is with the Mincare Traveler Legal Support Service within Legal Aid Board. So people might have remembered or might have met Susan Fay back in the day. Um, she would have taken on when this role had first started. She had taken up the role. And then Chris McCann, who was previously with the Free Legal Aid Board, or geez, it's not Free Legal Aid, free, the Free Legal Advice Center, he had then moved into that role. Um, so Claire's gonna give just a short input at the end, just while we have everyone, just more around what that um, Traveler Legal Support Unit can really do. Um, it's a bit sideways from domestic violence, but it could be something that, um, you know, would be useful to link in with Claire, you know, in some of your other advocacy work. Um, so look at, thanks again, and I'm gonna hand you now over to Jessica and stop talking for the morning. Super, thank you so much, Bridget. And I just firstly like to say thank you on behalf of myself and indeed Claire for inviting us today. We're really delighted to get this opportunity to meet everybody and we're really looking forward to it. I suppose I hope everybody has a cup of tea or coffee with them at this point. There is a lot to domestic violence and I'm anxious to try and convey as much information as possible around the, this area. So I suppose if anyone has any questions as we go through the slides, please feel free to ask them there. And then equally, I've left time at the end if people would prefer to wait um, and ask them then. So I suppose Bridget contacted me to ask me to look at domestic violence in general in terms of court orders the application process in terms of going to court to secure a domestic violence order. And then finally, I suppose, to, to look at legal aid and how one goes about applying for legal aid. So I suppose to break that down, I think it's important that we would first look at what is domestic violence and then who is eligible to apply to the court to seek such relief. Then there are a number of different domestic violence orders. So I'm going to try to go through each of those with you to see um, who can apply for them and what each of those looks like and what protections they would provide to individuals. Then we'll move on to look at the Legal Aid Board in general, what services and support we provide and what is our application process. And at that point, then I'll hand over to my colleague, Claire, who will discuss her unit in particular. So if we look at domestic violence first, I think that there is a general acknowledgement out there that domestic violence or abuse can happen to anybody. Um, often it's referred to as domestic violence. Other times it's referred to as domestic abuse. It can include physical, emotional or sexual abuse. And it can happen in couple relationships or between family members. It can happen against women and men, and it can happen against children. And I suppose the thing to remember with the different types of domestic violence or abuse is that in all instances, it's about the abuser having power and control over the other person. So I suppose it is a universal concept and it can affect anybody at any time. So then in terms of domestic violence, if we try to break it down and see what does domestic violence look like in terms of day-to-day -day experiences, and you can see it can range from emotional abuse to coercive control to elder abuse. But we need to dig a bit deeper into each of those concepts to see what does emotional abuse actually look like or how would one identify if they are suffering from a, a different type of abuse. So for example, emotional abuse may include something like experiencing constant criticism, having your belongings destroyed, being controlled by somebody or always being put down, for example. Physical abuse can mean that you are being hurt by somebody in a particular way 
So it may be that you're being deliberately injured, that you've been spat on, that you've been attacked or assaulted, that you've been pushed, that you've been punched, that you've been slapped, maybe beaten, or maybe pulled by your hair. And again, these lists are not exclusive. Of course, there are other things in each of these different types of abuse, but it's just to give some examples of what each of them might look like. In terms of sexual abuse, then, it could be that you've been raped, you've been maybe touched inappropriately, or forced to strip or give sexual favours. Then neglect, people mightn't always think that, that would come in as um, a domestic violence incident. But neglect can happen particularly to young people, such as children, a dependent person, or it can also feed into elder abuse. And things that would constitute neglect would be where a person is deprived of maybe food, money, somewhere warm and clean to live, care or supervision, clothing or medical care. Then perhaps one that is becoming more and more prevalent within the court system is that of financial and economic abuse. And that would be where somebody stops you having access to essential resources such as food, clothing or transport. Or the person may also try to stop you improving your economic status, for example, by preventing you from having training, education or employment. So um, coercive control may be something that many of you might have heard about in the media in recent times. It's something that we would have seen a lot. There were some high profile cases in the last 12 months. And coercive control is a criminal matter. It's a criminal offence. And I'm going to go through that later on. But just to give examples again of what coercive control can look like in practice, it's when somebody uses controlling or threatening behaviour to make you dependent on them. So it could include isolating you from your friends and family or support services, depriving you of basic needs such as food, monitoring you via online communication tools or spyware, controlling where you go, who you can see, what you can wear or where you can sleep, repeatedly pushing you down, humiliating, degrading, or dehumanizing you, controlling your finances, or making threats or intimidating you. And then finally, we have elder abuse. And generally speaking, elder abuse would be for persons over the age of 65. And that abuse can feed into some of the previous ones we've looked at, such as being physical, financial, psychological or sexual. So I suppose the purpose of giving those examples was just for you to realize how in practice a person may be experiencing the various types of abuse. And we will come back to this later in the presentation for when a person is applying for a domestic violence order before the court. So in terms of the legislation that governs the area of domestic violence in Ireland, that is the Domestic Violence Act of 2018. It's a relatively new piece of legislation and it consolidates and reforms the law on domestic violence in Ireland. So it only became law on the 1st of January 2019, so it is still quite new. And it recognises in law the impact of emotional abuse and the offence of coercive control. So under our previous legislation, there was much greater consideration given to physical abuse over emotional abuse. But our new law that came into force in 2019 now recognises the impact that emotional abuse can have as well. And in particular, the offence of coercive control. And I suppose the law was very much welcomed for that reason. Also, this new law has provided additional remedies and support for, for people attending court. It now provides for an emergency barring order. It offers the opportunity to give evidence through the television link. So, for example, if you did not feel comfortable giving evidence in front of the person that you alleged has caused the abuse against you, 
you can request to give your evidence through a television link. Also, the views of children can now be considered by the court when a person is applying for a domestic violence order. There's information on support services, recommendations for engagement with services, restrictions on court attendance, prohibition of the publication or broadcast of any information pertaining to domestic violence applications, and also the offence of forced marriage. So perhaps most people would have been familiar with our Domestic Violence Act of 1996, but I suppose just to be aware that no longer exists, it has been repealed, as has our Domestic Violence Act of 1999 and the Amendment Act. So from now on, we're focusing on the Domestic Violence Act of 2018. So I suppose just some statistics on domestic violence, which may be helpful. So applications to the district court under the domestic violence legislation increased by 12% in 2020 to 22,970 from 20,501 in 2019. Now, I know those figures aren't exactly new, but the court reports take a while to be published. But I suppose the message that I want to get across is that the district courts in Ireland are very familiar and very comfortable with dealing with domestic violence applications. They do it on a daily basis. So no person should feel afraid going into the court, either to speak to the staff or to go into the judge because they are very well versed in the area of domestic violence. Equally, there were nearly 54,000 domestic abuse incidents attended by Angorda Siakana during 2022. So it's my understanding that in each guard station, there is at least one member of staff that is trained in the area of domestic violence. So again, people should feel comfortable in contacting the guardy because they too are well used to dealing with such incidents. Then, as we discussed previously, course of control between 2019 and 2021, 259 incidents of course of control were reported, with 146 of those being reported in 2021, a 62% increase on the 90 incidents reported in 2020. So, as I said, the legislation only came into being in 2019. So, you can see. The longer the legislation will be enforced, the more people that will be reporting incidents of course of control, and we would anticipate that those figures would continue to increase. So we might move on now to look at the court orders and the types of protection that is available. So I'm hoping to go through each one of these individually. But in general, the types of orders that you can receive from a court would be a protection order, a safety order, an interim barring order, an emergency barring order, your standard barring order. And then at the end, I want to look at an undertaking. An undertaking is not a court order, but it is something that you may come across when you do go into court seeking your long term order. So we will discuss that at the end. So the first one is that of a protection order. And generally speaking, most people that attend at the district court seeking protection under the Domestic Violence Act will look for a protection order first. So a protection order is an interim order and it's granted on an ex parte basis, which stops the person accused of abusive behaviour they'd be known as the respondent, from committing further violence or threats of violence. So this is an interim order, which means it will only last from the date that you apply and were granted the order until the date the matter is back into court for the safety order. So generally speaking, you would get this order for a couple of months. It's granted on an ex parte basis. So what that means is that the respondent, the person that you are accusing of committing the abusive behaviour will not be present. So when you attend court looking for your protection order, they will have no knowledge that you have gone to the court office and applied for this. Importantly, it's 
to note, this is not a barring order. And a protection order does not mean that the respondent has to leave the home if they are living with you. If the person is not living with you, the protection order prohibits or bans them from watching or being near your home and following or communicating, including electronically with you or a dependent such as a child. So that would prevent them from also sending emails to you or sending text messages to you. And as I said, the protection order remains in place until the hearing of the safety order application. So it's an interim order only. Um, because it's a temporary order and only effective until the court hearing, um, it's sometimes called a temporary safety order because it gives the same protection as a safety order, but for a shorter period. So some people may call them temporary safety orders, but the correct legal name for them is a protection order. So I suppose who can apply to the court for a protection order? And importantly, the 2018 Act for the first time amended the law to ensure people in an intimate relationship are able to apply for a protection order. So previously couples had to cohabit or live together to be able to get a protection order, but this is no longer the case. So for example, if a couple were dating, but they were not living together, they would be entitled to secure a protection order. And this is seen as a very positive step forward by the 2018 Act because it allows more people to secure this type of protection. So in general, the people that can apply are spouses and civil partners, parents with a child in common, partners in an intimate relationship, so including cohabitants, a couple that live together, but also dating partners, so a couple not living together, parents of an abusive child if that child is over 18, but the child would have to be over 18, people residing with the respondent in a non-contractual relationship, so such as two relatives living together. So for example, if we look back to our elder abuse scenario, it potentially if you had two siblings living together, one was alleging elder abuse, they could apply for a protection order before the court. Also, former partners are able to apply. So for example, if you were divorced or legally separated, as a former spouse, you could apply, or as a former cohabitant. So that is the interim order, the interim protection order. The next one is a safety order, and a safety order is the exact same as a protection order, except it lasts for a much longer period. But the people who can apply for it and the protection it provides is the exact same as that of a protection order. So again, the safety order is an instruction from the court which stops the person accused of abusive behaviour. That's what the respondent, and they'd be listed on the proceedings as the respondent, from committing further violence or threats of violence. Again, and this is really important because sometimes people get confused on this, the respondent does not have to leave the home. So a safety order is not a barring order. And if a person has a safety order and it's served on them, it does not mean they have to leave the home. If the person is not living with you, the safety order prohibits them from watching or being near your home or following or communicating, including electronically with you or a dependent person such as a child. So for example, if the respondent was texting the child, that would be considered a breach of your protection under a safety order. Now, how long can a safety order last? A safety order can last for up to five years. That's not to say it's automatic that a judge would decide that they would grant it for five years. It's anywhere between a couple of months up to five years. And that would depend on the facts of each individual case and the seriousness of what has gone on. So again, as I said, who can apply for a safety order? It's the exact same people that can apply for the protection order. So the safety order is the follow on permanent order to the interim order of this of the protection order. 
So again, it's spouses and civil partners, parents with a child in common, partners in an intimate relationship, so people living together or dating partners, parents of an abusive child, if that child is over 18, people residing with the respondent in a non-contractual relationship, and former partners such as a former spouse or cohabitant. So the details and information for a protection order and a safety order are very, very similar. The next order now is that of a barring order. And a barring order is much more serious because the consequences are that the respondent is no longer entitled to remain in the home. So a barring order requires the person accused of the abusive behaviour to leave the home and prohibits or bans the person from re-entering that home. In addition to that, the order also prohibits the person from further violence or threats of violence, watching or being near your home, or following or communicating, including electronically, with you or a dependent person. And a barring order can last up to three years. So we know a safety order can last up to five years, but a barring order at its maximum can only last up to three years. Now, the persons who are entitled to apply for a barring order are also much more limited. And again, that is because of the severity of the order in that a person is forced to leave their home. So the people that can apply for a barring order would be spouses and civil partners, cohabitants, which is a couple living together, who live in an intimate relationship. However, there is a caveat with that, and the applicant must satisfy the property test. That is, they must have an equal or greater interest in the property than the respondent. So it would be the case that the applicant would have to own the property, they, or they would have to own at least 50% of the property, or would have to be named on the lease for them to be in a position to apply for a barring order. The other group are parents where the abuser is a non-dependent child. So for example, if you have two parents that own their house and they have a child who is 24, so they're no longer dependent and they're causing trouble, those parents could apply to the court to seek a barring order to have that non-dependent child removed from the property. Then there is what is called an interim barring order. And again, this can be very useful. So between the time of making an application for a barring order and the court's decision on that, there may be reasonable grounds for believing that the safety and welfare of the applicant or a dependent person is at risk. If so, the court can grant a protection order or an interim barring order. So when a person goes into court and explains what has happened to them, the judge may be concerned that it is of such a serious nature that an interim barring order would be required. Now, an interim barring order is a temporary, immediate, short-term order, and it lasts for a maximum of eight working days. So it's quite a short period. And it requires the person accused of violent or abusive behaviour to leave the home where there is an immediate risk of significant harm to the applicant or a dependent person and a protection order would not give sufficient protection. So as you can see, the threshold here is very high in terms of being able to secure an interim barring order. So you'd have to be able to prove to the court that the risk to you or a dependent child is immediate, that something is going to happen quite, quite soon and also that the harm must be significant. It can't be just low level incident. It has to be that there's a risk of something quite significant happening in the next number of days. Something that a protection order wouldn't be able to cover. You can apply for an interim barring order while you wait for the court to hear your application for a full barring order. And both applications can be made at the same time. So what I would recommend is that when a person attends at their local district court office, they would apply for a protection order, a barring order, and also an interim barring order. 
If the court refuses your interim barring order application, they may offer you a protection order. But if you don't apply for them, the court won't be necessarily in a position to grant it. So you should always apply for a protection order and an interim barring order if you feel the situation merits that. Then there is another type of barring order, and that is an emergency barring order. And an emergency barring order requires the person accused of violent or abusive behaviour to leave the home and prohibits them from re-entering. So again, it has the exact same purpose in that the person accused would have to leave the home immediately. It's an immediate order where there is reasonable grounds to believe there is an immediate risk of significant harm to the applicant or a dependent person. So the test for an interim barring order and an emergency barring order is the same. There has to be an immediate risk of significant harm. Interestingly, and I think this is where the emergency barring order can become very useful, is that unlike the interim barring order, the applicant does not have to satisfy the property test to be able to get an emergency barring order. This means the person applying for the order does not need to own, co-own, or have their name on the lease of the property. So therefore, the emergency barring order is available to a whole cohort of people that the interim barring order and the general barring order are not. So I think this is a useful one to remember. Again, the emergency barring order can last for a maximum of eight working days and it prohibits the same behaviour as a barring order. Then when the eight day time limit ends, you have to wait for one month to apply for another. In exceptional circumstances, a judge can waive or ignore this one month time wait. However, it is at the discretion of a judge and generally speaking, you do have to wait a further one month after the eight day time limit ends. So I suppose they are the general orders that are available through the court system when one is seeking protection from domestic violence. In order to get a protection, a safety or a barring order, you must attend a district court hearing. While you are waiting for the court to hear your application, the court can give you an immediate order, such as the protection order or the interim or emergency barring orders. So those are the three orders that you can get very quickly once you attend your local district court office. It's important to note too that in an emergency situation, the Gardaí can request that the court service arrange a special out of hour sitting of the district court for someone looking for an interim barring order, a protection order or an emergency barring order. However, what I would say from my experience is that it really would have to be a very serious situation for the courts to sit out of hours. So this doesn't happen regularly in, a, in any situation. It's only if there is something quite extraordinary that the courts would do that. And I suppose just to note, a safety order or a barring order can be renewed by applying for a further order before the previous one expires. So as you know, your safety order can last for up to five years and your barring order for up to three years. And if you feel that if that were to expire, that there would be a risk that something would happen, you can go back into the court and seek for the court to provide you with an additional safety or barring order. But again, you would have to be able to prove that there is some type of threat that you feel somehow intimidated or put in fear. Now, this is perhaps maybe one of the most important parts of your application for a domestic violence relief before the court. And this is your information sheet, or it can be known as your statement of facts. So when you attend at your district court office and you advise them that you're seeking some type of protection from domestic violence, they will ask you to write out what it is that has happened and why you feel you need the protection of the court. What I say to my clients always is they need to do this in advance. So if you know you're going to be attending court, that you're going to be seeking an order from the court, you need to write this out uh, in advance. 
So all applications to the court office seeking relief under the Domestic Violence Act require the applicant to complete a statement of facts. And the purpose of this document is to ground your application for the relief you are seeking. So when compiling an information sheet for a domestic violence application, it's essential to provide clear and concise details that support your case. And what I would suggest is you would start off by giving a brief introduction, start by introducing yourself and briefly explaining the situation. Mention that you are seeking legal protection due to domestic violence. Then you need to include your personal information, so that's your full name, your address, your contact details, and any relevant identification. If you have any children, you should also include their names and ages, because remember, any domestic violence order will also cover the dependents as well as you. So the court needs to know their names and ages and also their date of birth. You also need to include the respondent's full name, address and contact details. So the respondent is the person that you are alleging has committed the act of domestic violence against you. Then a very important part that you must include are the incident details. So you need to describe the incidents of domestic violence that you have experienced. And you have to be specific about the dates, the times and the locations. So the more detailed this statement can be, the more accurate you can be in terms of the date and the time, et cetera, the better it is for you when your application goes before the court. So that's why I'm saying it's a good idea to do this in advance of attending at the court office so you can think about dates and times, et cetera. Then you need to include information about the type of abuse. Was it physical, emotional, sexual, financial, and any injury sustained? So if you refer back to the type of abuse and the examples that we have, you need to provide your examples here as to what happened to you. You also need to mention any witnesses who can corroborate your account. So for example, were your dependent children in the house when this happened? Had a neighbour called over and witnessed the event? Or did you have a friend on the phone, for example, that heard what happened? And that, again, is very important. Then you also need to attach any relevant evidence, such as medical reports from doctors or hospitals. So after the incident, did you go to A&E? Did you go to your GP the next day? they would have made a note of that and you could exhibit that then as, as part of your application. Are there any police reports or incident numbers? Are there photographs of injuries or damaged property? Are there text messages, emails or voicemails related to the abuse? And what I would say to you is you cannot produce these later. So some people think that they can you know, just complete the form as best they can and that they can add to the form or they can add information or documentation afterwards. But from a procedural point of view, you're not allowed to do that. So everything has to be included at the initial stage. And that's why it's so important to take your time going through your statement of facts. Then you should explain the safety concerns. So explain why you need protection. Highlight any immediate risks to your safety or the safety of your children. And if you fear retaliation, mention it in your information sheet. So if you're concerned that it's going to happen again, if you know it has happened prior to the incident that you have just written about, you need to include that as well. Because the more information the judge has, the better your chance of securing the order you're looking for. Then you should also identify for the court what order it is that you are looking for. So are you looking for a barring order that would prevent the person from entering your home? Are you looking for a safety order or a protection order, which doesn't remove the person from the home, but it prevents them from putting you in fear and that of the dependent children going forward? Now, what I would also say is important to include are any relevant details such as financial dependence, threats or patterns of abuse. So generally speaking, in cases of domestic violence, 
it's rare that it's a one-off incident. So of course something happened, a one-off incident that triggered you contacting the court office, but more than likely things have happened in the past too. These patterns of abuse should be included in your statement of facts. Equally, if you have left the home, provide your current living arrangements. So for example, perhaps you had to seek shelter in a refuge because you no longer felt safe in your home. You need to include that in your information sheet as well. And I think this is a part that a lot of people don't realize that you need to remember that the information contained in your information sheet is the only information that a judge will consider when deliberating on granting the order. So if you haven't stated it in your information sheet and you go into court and then you decide you want to tell the court about other incidents that took place, for example, the court can take that into account. So everything needs to be included on your information sheet. Furthermore, the same statement of fact is used to ground your application for a safety or barring order, as well as the initial protection order. You cannot add further information later. So as you know, if you go in seeking an interim or emergency barring order or a protection order, the matter will then be come back before the court for a full hearing of the safety order or a barring order the same statement of facts will be relied on. So you have to really make sure that it's as detailed as it possibly can be. Also, people don't realize that the statement of facts will be provided to the respondent, the alleged proponent of the abuse or their legal representative, and you will be cross-examined on this information. So the more detailed and specific the statement can be, the better. So I suppose just to be aware that this document is going to be part of the court process until it's concluded. The other side will read it. Obviously, they're going to have their own comments to make on it. And you'll be cross-examined by their representatives on what's in your information sheet. So you need to make sure it's accurate and it's correct and that you can stand over everything you put in your information sheet. So then, by virtue of the 2018 Act, there are certain things all courts have to take into account when they are deciding whether or not an application for a domestic violence order should succeed. And I think it might be helpful when you're completing your information sheet to consider these points, because if you can include examples of these in your information sheet, it then becomes a tick box, box exercise for the judge and it makes it more straightforward for the judge to grant you your order. So the court will have to consider a history of violence by the respondent towards the applicant or any dependent person. So that's why we're saying in your information sheet, if there's a pattern of abuse, if other things have happened before, you need to include them in your information sheet. Also, if there's an increase in the severity or frequency of violence towards the applicant or their children. So generally speaking, by virtue of the fact you decided to contact the court office, there may have been an increase in the violence. So include that in your information sheet. Exposure of children to violence inflicted by the respondent on the applicant or other child. So have the children experienced violence? If so, include it. Have they witnessed violence being inflicted on the applicant, for example? You need to include that. If there is a history of animal cruelty, often people don't realise that that's a factor that could be considered. So it doesn't just relate to people anymore. But if there's any history of animal cruelty, include that too. Substance abuse, including alcohol by the respondent, the applicant or a dependent person. So if there's any um, abuse or I suppose drugs or alcohol, if, if that forms part of what happens, you need to include that also. And then the age and state of health, including pregnancy of the applicant or any dependent person. So again, it's no harm just to consider those when you're completing an information sheet. Then you might recall I said I just wanted to go through what is an undertaking with you. 
So generally speaking, when a person applies and secures a protection order, they wait a number of months until the case is called back into court for the safety order application. And at that stage, you may be contacted by the other side or the solicitor representing the respondent asking, would you accept an undertaking instead of agreeing to a form of safety order? And it's something that you just need to consider because it doesn't give the same protection as that of a formal court order. So an undertaking is a promise provided by the respondent on oath to the court and the applicant that they will not put them in fear going forward. It is important to be aware that an undertaking is not enforceable in the same manner as a court order. So should a respondent breach an undertaking, the applicant would need to return to court seeking to find the respondent in contempt of court. It's an additional court application. So if, for example, uh, the respondent breaches a safety order, you ring the guards, the guards arrive, the respondent is taken away and arrested. And that is the purpose of a safety order, that you have the security in knowing that if the person breaches the order, they're automatically in trouble with Angorda Shia Kona. The difficulty with the undertaking is that if you accept that and then they breach it and you contact the guardie, the guardie cannot assist you. And instead, you would have to go back to court, bring another application and state that the person has been in contempt of court because they breached their promise and you would have to prove that to the court. So just to be aware, a breach of a domestic violence order can be prosecuted by Angorda Shiokana, but a breach of an undertaking cannot. And what you will find often in court is the respondent solicitor will ask you, would you take an undertaking? And it is a decision that you may have to make. And you just need to be aware that you wouldn't necessarily have the same protection as you would with a domestic violence order. So I suppose I just put this slide in because, as you will recall, uh, there are different categories of persons eligible for barring orders than there are for protection and safety orders. So this one slide, I just put it in so that you can see exactly who's eligible for which type of order. The other thing that I will say is in terms of children, that the Domestic Violence Act contains specific provisions for the protection of children, and children can now make their views known to the court where a safety or barring order is sought on behalf of or will relate to a child. And the court now also has the power to appoint an expert to assist the court in securing the views of the child. Equally, when giving evidence in an application for a domestic violence order, a child cannot be cross-examined by either the applicant or the respondent, but they can certainly meet with the judge and give evidence should they so wish. And this is a point that some people don't know, that domestic violence orders relating to children remain in force until the order expires, even after they reach the age of 18. So previously they expired when the child became 18 years old, but now they continue until the actual order expires. So if the order is for five years and the child is past 18, that order still exists. Also, just be aware that the Child and Family Agency can apply for a safety or barring order against a violent adult on behalf of a child, whether or not the violent adult is married to the child's parent. So now the Child and Family Agency can also bring an application should they feel the need. So in terms of what happens if the order is broken, so anyone who breaches a protection, safety, interim emergency or barring order, is automatically guilty of an offence. There is a second offence where the person, so the respondent to the order, prevents you or your dependent from entering or remaining in a place to which the order relates. That is an offence. So very often a person can be charged with two offences from the one incident. Then they will be punished before the district court. They can be subject to a fine or a term of imprisonment up to 12 months or both. 
And just to note that when the court is deciding the sentencing for certain offences, such as psychological, physical, sexual violence, coercive control or stalking, it is now considered an aggravating circumstance if the victim is or was a spouse, civil partner or in an intimate relationship with the offender. So that means they would get a greater sentence by virtue of the relationship between the person accused of committing the offence. So that was introduced by Section 40 of the Domestic Violence Act. And again, that's been commended um, because it recognises that, that the relationship between partners and the effect that violence can have on intimate relationships. So again, I just put this slide in. There are links here in terms of how to apply for your domestic violence order. The court service have very helpfully put up a step-by-step -step guide for applying for the order. So if you click on that link, you can go straight to the district court website and they talk you through the steps. Of course, you can hire a solicitor to make an application on your behalf or you can make the application yourself. You may be entitled to legal aid, and I'm going to discuss that next. So you go to your local district court office, and if you click on that link there, there's a list of the various offices across the country. The district court office staff will tell you the forms you need to make your application. If you are applying for a barring or safety order, the court clerk will arrange a court date for a court hearing. You will be given a summons for the court hearing at the time of your application and the forms will be sent to the respondent, the person accused of the violent or abusive behaviour so that they too can attend court on the day. You do not need a solicitor to make an application for any of the interim orders, but it is recommended that you would have legal representation for a full court hearing. The decision of the court, so when the court decides to grant you an order, that's produced in a form of a written document called an order, so a protection order, a safety order, a barring order. And if the respondent is in court when the order is made, the respondent is considered to be notified and it is sent by the court office to the respondent by ordinary post. In the case of a protection order, an interim barring order or an emergency barring order, the court usually directs that the order be served on the respondent by a member of the guardi. So the court office will notify the guardi of the making of the order by sending a copy to the local guard station by post. But to avoid any delay in notifying the guardi, I recommend that all of my clients should call to the guard station immediately after the order has been made, tell them of the making of the order and leave a copy with them. You can allow them to take a photocopy if you've not done so already. And a copy of the order will then be sent to the superintendent of your local guard station by registered post the following day. So I suppose they are the general uh, domestic violence applications and how you go about applying for them in the court. I just wanted to briefly look at coercive control because I think a lot of people will have heard that term of late. And I just want to be clear that you don't apply for a course of control application in the district court. Rather, it's a criminal matter and you start off by contacting Angarda Shia Khanna. So it was introduced under the Domestic Violence Act 2018. And for the first time, we now have an offence of course of control, which is criminal in nature under Section 39 of the Domestic Violence Act. And I suppose a person commits an offence of coercive control if they knowingly and persistently engage in behaviour that is controlling or coercive, has a serious effect, and a reasonable person would likely consider it to have a serious effect on the relevant person. So again, coercive control refers to patterns of behaviour that manipulate, dominate, intimidate someone within an intimate relationship. It goes beyond physical violence and includes emotional, psychological and financial abuse. So again, this is a complete modernization of our law because up until the 2018 Act, we didn't recognize course of control as a criminal offense. So we must be able to prove for the offense that it has a serious effect on the person. So that means that the, the behavior causes them to have a fear of violence or causes serious alarm or distress. 
cycles, it's just important to know that obviously you can explain that coercive control happens to you as part of your application for a domestic violence order, but equally you now have the opportunity to contact the guards and for a criminal prosecution to be instituted based on the coercive control. Again, if you are convicted of coercive control in the district court, you might be fined or subject to a term of imprisonment of 12 months. If you're convicted in the higher courts, there could be a term of imprisonment for up to five years. So I suppose the course control legislation recognises the insidious nature of non-physical abuse and provides legal recourse for victims. And it aims to create a safer environment within intimate relationships. So again, just to remember that the offence of course of control is criminal in nature and a complaint must be made to Angorda Shia Khanna. Coercive control is also recognised by the courts in terms of the available domestic violence orders. And so finally then, just to move on to the Legal Aid Board, what we do and how we can assist in domestic violence applications. So in general, the Legal Aid Board is an independent, publicly funded organisation providing civil legal aid and advice and family mediation services. So in terms of our civil legal aid and advice, we can give you advice about your legal problem. We can help you try to solve your problem. And if you need to go to court, we may be able to provide you with a solicitor and or a barrister to represent you. Equally, we offer family mediation, which is a free service which we provide to help separating couples and parents whose relationship has broken down to negotiate their own agreement. And I have included here in the links the various application forms and in terms of domestic violence, if you were applying, it would be the first form, the civil legal aid application form. And I just put here a screenshot of what that application form looks like, just so people have an idea. In terms of our financial eligibility test, so in order to get civil legal aid and or advice, we must undertake a means test of your financial circumstances to see if you qualify. So to get civil legal aid and advice, you will need to have an annual disposable income of less than 18,000 and disposable assets of less than 100,000. So every application, every applicant has to complete this means test and has to satisfy it to be eligible for legal aid. In both cases, we do apply certain allowances and we do not include the house in which you live when we calculate your assets. So in most cases, you will have to make a payment, which we call a contribution, but there are two instances in which you don't. One is the child and family agency are involved and they are removing a child from your care or they're seeking a supervision order. And the second one you will see is for domestic violence. So if you're attending the district court for a barring order, safety order, protection order, you will not be charged any fee by the legal aid board. It is free of charge, provided that you initially satisfy our means test. So I think that is very important to note that for the purposes of the presentation today and domestic violence, there will be no contribution payable. So the documentation that you need to apply for legal aid, we will be seeking proof of address, identification and proof of means. So we will be looking for a pay slip or a social welfare receipt, details of any other income you receive, details of any tax that you pay, details of your monthly mortgage or rent payments, approximate values of all your capital assets except your house so for example if you have a car any bank account the value of any savings that you have and any debts that are in your name so where do you go to apply for legal aid you can apply online and i attach here the link so that you can apply online the form is very straightforward. You upload the documentation that we request. Equally, you can contact one of our 33 law centres located across the country. An application form can be posted out to you if you telephone any of our offices. Or equally, you can attend at the law centre where assistance will be provided in completing the application form. 
and a list of our law centres is available on our website and I've included that there. And our centres are open from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. and from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. And again, this is just a screenshot to show where our centres are located across the country. You will see that on our website when you visit it and the list of the various counties where we have law centres. Again, just other support that people may or may not be aware of in terms of domestic violence. Women's Aid provides free and confidential support to people experiencing domestic violence, their family and friends and professionals supporting victims of abuse. They have a free phone helpline, a telephone interpretation service, an online chat service, a text service, a drop-in service in Dalton House in Dublin. Safe Ireland can be useful because Safe Ireland has up-to-date information on the location of local domestic violence supports and services and also the locations of various refuges across the country. Men, they then formerly known as AMEN, provides a confidential helpline and a support service and information for people and their families experiencing domestic violence also. And I've just included their contact details there. So I suppose that's it from the purposes of my part of the presentation. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Claire, who's going to discuss her law centre. And then if anybody has any questions, we can consider those. So I'll hand over to Claire now. Thank you very much, Jessica. <clears throat> so um, just we uh, appear at two different people a bit for everybody here to understand when Bridget first came with the idea of this webinar um, I know that Chris McCann who was a managing solicitor of the Minka Traveler Legal Support Service would have assisted with this kind of presentations in the past but we care to have Jessica here as an expert because the message, message here is a bit as a Minka Traveler Legal Support Service we are experts in some other areas of law but um, for everything that, that goes with uh, family law, uh, domestic violence, um, uh, child custody cases, this would be the specialty of the legal aid board as a whole. So the message is basically to tell you if there is anything that your uh, clients or people that you're helping um, need to bring to the attention to the legal aid board because they want to apply for legal advice or maybe to get a solicitor or a barrister uh, in court to represent them. If it's family law, if it's if it's uh, child uh, care, custody and domestic violence, it would be for your local law center. So a law center like the one of Jessica uh, that we would ask you to address your, um, your application because uh, our law center is specialized on other areas of law. So just for a general presentation, you may have heard about the Minka Traveler Legal Support Service in the past, you may not. Uh, we are a law center which is based in Dublin. In uh, Recently we moved to Ballymun. Uh, our office is there, but we are covering every place in Ireland. And, and we can do that because we have this partnership with all the local law centers of the Legal Aid Board everywhere in the country. So if uh, a client of yours or if anybody you, you know of want to make an application for Legal Aid uh, to be put to the Traveler Legal Support Service, um, they can simply go to the local law center and, and explain to the person who's going to help them fill the forms that they want to apply for the legal uh, service for travelers uh, of the legal aid board. Or they can also do this online in the forms that Jessica uh, showed you before, uh, just ticking the box of the Mink Minker Traveler Legal Support Service. So as I said before, we don't do all of the areas of laws that can be covered by the legal aid board, but we tend to specialize on the specific needs of travelers and all the cases that, that are, um, I would say, linked to um, a differential situation and a differential vulnerability of the traveler population. So in general, we deal with housing law and discrimination cases. In housing law, uh, we do advocacy work to help clients who made a social housing application most of the time with their uh, local authority, so being like a city council or a county council of their area um, where, where they want to apply for, for housing. Now, it may not be a case that we would bring in court. Most of the time, it's not the case. But we are very happy to receive application to provide legal advice to clients as long as they pass the financial test that Jessica explained before and, and to send letters for them. Uh, when a person passes a financial test, 
within the scope of legal advice, what we can bring is uh, write letters for the client, negotiate for the client. We can talk to the other side, meaning to the local authority for the clients. We can inquire as to what is the state of their uh, housing application, what happened in their case, and try to see if there is any kind of advocacy we can do to help them um, get their application process maybe faster, um, show any criteria for um, for a priority, etc., for them to access uh, social housing. Then the second case uh, type of housing law cases that we have are unfortunately lots of eviction cases. And is this, I would say, uh, please, if you have any client or any person you hear about who have an eviction case, just apply and, and, and talk to us, you know, and try to see if we can help because we have this ability to react quite fast on eviction cases, maybe because a person is or a family is living in a caravan on the side of the road and the local authority tells them, you have no right to be here, we're going to remove your caravan, please knock at our door, just refer the case to us and we're going to see how we can help. It can be another kind of uh, eviction case. It can be people who are evicted from uh, their housing, um, their social housing, for example. Uh, equally, we were we're all gonna always gonna try and see if we can help. Some cases, for example, private housing would not be within the scope of what the legal aid board can help with in court. But it's not because we cannot go in court that we cannot uh, provide legal advice. So basically, the invitation, the invitation here is, again, if you have any case that you think come within the remit of the work we do, just call us. We can provide um, advice on what we do, what we don't do. But what we can always do is provide legal, uh, legal advice to a person who um, fits the financial test of the legal aid board. The third kind of cases we deal with are discrimination cases. Here, some of you may know that in Ireland, you have two different types of uh, laws that would apply to discrimination cases. If a discrimination is committed within uh, a licensed premises where there is a, a license to sell alcohol or at the point of entry to this, meaning, for example, a client enters a pub and they don't want to serve them alcohol or enters a club where they can sell alcohol and refuse them entry, or there is any other incident that can be associated, like which is felt as a client as a discrimination event, we would have the ability to provide legal advice. And if the case passes a merits test of the legal aid board, we may be in a position to help the person and defend them in court. Then if it's not within the area of the license premises or at the point of entry trade to license premises, this kind of discrimination cases would be under the jurisdiction of the Workplace Relations Commission under the Equal Status Act. Now, under the Equal Status Act, we are not the ability to go to court for a client, but we can still provide legal advice if the person passes the financial test. And we're very happy to try and help clients to prepare a case because in the Workplace Relations Commission, there is no cost. So there is no risk of bringing a case that they may be liable to cost if the case is not successful. And the person can present themselves on their own to bring a case. So we're also very happy to try and help people to, you know, have the courage to just bring this type of cases to court and try to find if some other organization can bring them representation if we can't. So uh, just to conclude, we are not uh, a law center that deal with family law cases, children cases, custody cases, or domestic violence cases, but we are very happy to find um, any competent person when we receive you know, a call, when we receive an email, it can be from client directly, it can be from traveler organization. Sometimes traveler organization writes uh, to us and say, I have a legal problem here for a client, can you help? Uh, if it's within the remit of our competence, of course we can help. If we, if we can't, we always try to find somebody who can. So we have a network of other organizations and we have a huge network within the legal aid board itself to try and find who is a good person to answer a legal query. Uh, and as I said before, the intention of the creation of the Minker Traveler Legal Support Service here is to make sure that travelers have um, a dedicated service uh, for the specific needs, but also to help them and, and, and facilitate the access of travelers to, uh, to, to legal services. Uh, so I'm also very um, happy to receive questions and, um, and I hope this was clear. Thank you very much. And, and I'm very glad we could have this opportunity to, to share information with you all today. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I might just for I think a couple of people had questions, so I'm just going to stop the recording. That's okay with.